Thanks, Chad. I'm very, very humbled and grateful to be with you tonight. Uh, you guys, I, I hope you realize that you have a fantastic team of ministers here. Uh, J.D., Andrew, and Chad, they, they are guys that I have the utmost respect for and have known all of them now for several years and have always enjoyed working with them on different projects uh, and always trying to thieve ideas from each other um, throughout the year. I love this idea of kingdom. Tonight we're talking specifically about being image bearers in the digital age. When we think of the Bible, a lot of times folks outside our fellowship or outside the, the world of Christianity will think in terms of antiquity, of, of old, of ancient, of outdated, ir, uh, irrelevant. I think it's really, really important for those of us who believe in God, those of us who live according to His Word, to make sure that ever so often we, we sort of recalibrate our terms with the society and culture around us so that especially emerging generations understand exactly how the scriptures are relevant, not only in the ancient times to the people that it was written, these letters were written directly to, but also to us today for the people that Jesus prayed for in the garden, those that would come and believe in him even without seeing him. Scriptures today are as relevant, if not more relevant than they have ever been. And tonight, specifically, we want to talk about this idea of living in the digital age. When you think of technology, I'm not sure what comes to mind for you. Uh, for me, I usually think of modern things, but you think in terms of technology, it doesn't have to be modern. For instance, the light bulb. Many years ago, I think it was roughly somewhere in the 1870s, uh, my good friend, Mr., uh, Mr. Edison, came up with the incandescent light bulb. And I read somewhere where pre-light bulb, the average American got roughly 11 hours of sleep a night. Yeah, that's what I said. Uh, post light bulb, today ish, the relative average is seven hours of sleep at night. I have four small children. Seven hours sounds like the promised land to me. It's fantastic. So, regardless of how much sleep you get, imagine if you were to get four hours more on average. How less irritable would you be? How much more equipped for kingdom work would you be? How easier would it be for us to be patient, loving, kind? 11 hours, one invention, absolutely changed the world. It changed industries, it changed family life, it changed church life. Manufacturing took off because now we, didn't, we weren't confined to the sun. It, it kind of triggered in and ushered in this, this new revolution where we moved in our, our culture and society from an agricultural society to a more industrial society. It allowed factories to work around the clock. It allowed us to eventually come up with one of the greatest inventions of my lifetime, the clapper, where we could clap a light on and clap a light off. Today we're lazy and we asked Siri and Alexa to do that for us, but we, we've transitioned into this digital uh, stage of life, this digital age, and the light bulb was one of those fundamental technologies that today we take for granted. Today we have dozens, hundreds of light bulbs in almost every building we enter. The light bulb is not something that we really think about until we realize that we need to change it. We take it for granted, but it has fundamentally reshaped and transformed how we live in so many ways. If you think about the car, go back to a time again uh, where we were a more agrarian society, where most families lived on the family farm. And the car now allows us to live in different parts of the country, but still have some proximity within a relatively short period of time to get from where we live to where our grandparents live, or to get from where we live to where our, our friends live. It allows us the, the opportunity to move back and forth. Sometimes technology doesn't cooperate. Like when you press a button and thinking that it's going to do something and it does not, and then Thomas Edison just stares at you with those judgmental eyes of his. It's green. <clears throat> so not only do we have the light bulb, we have the car, which fundamentally now has changed travel. It's changed how we go about our daily lives. People live, people are part of industries that are based solely on travel, not specifically the Model T as you see here, but uh, tra uh, excuse me, trucking industry, we've got a busing industry, we've got vacation industries that are all molded and shaped by this one invention of technology that has taken on a new, a new shape. The latest one would be the computer and the internet age, and that is, to me, one of the most fundamental shifts in society and in family life and in church life and in industry that we've experienced over the last 30 or so years. It's really hard to imagine today in 2024 what life was like pre-internet. The majority of this room can remember, but emerging generations have no frame of reference to even that computer. 
right? They have, emerging generations have no reference to anything less than the computer being a handheld device. They have no idea what it means to hear the sound and being kicked off the phone because somebody wanted to get on the internet or vice versa. They don't know what a party line is. And I think that's important for us to acknowledge that, not just to show that I am now an old person and out of touch with the youth of today, but for us in, in this room where we have, we have teenagers and we have those that were teenagers a long time ago. There's a lot of life that's happened in between. There is a thing called the generation gap. And I think in some ways it's very real. But I also think in other ways we allow Satan to use that as leverage to make us think we're more different than we really are. We all live, all of us live in the digital age. The difference is some of us are being raised in the digital age and some of us are living out the sunset years of life in the digital age. We all coexist here. So we all have a hand in this. This is not a young people problem. This is not a parent problem. This is not a teenager problem. These are spiritual issues. And as believers in the gospel, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have to think spiritually, which means we have to think critically about the things that we put in our lives, the things that form us and shape us. Technology should inform us. Technology can give us access to all kinds of information. But when we allow it, technology absolutely will transform us. We have to exercise discernment and we have to cultivate wisdom to always have an accurate pulse on how technology is forming and shaping us. Tonight is not about social media. Tonight is not about computers. Tonight is about technology and how it forms and shapes us spiritually. When we don't think in terms of, of the gospel with regards to anything in our life, then there is a great chance for whatever that thing is to form us and shape us into the image of something that is very different than Jesus. And so tonight, we have to understand how technology is transforming us. When I think of a definition for technology, typically when I, I implement a new technology in my life, it's to help me be more efficient, it's to create more convenience or more comfort. Whoever came up with the HVAC system, I just, I'd love to give you a kiss on the forehead. I love it. Big fan. I've lived in Alabama my whole life. Air conditioner is a necessity. I don't know how northern people do without it. it does, it's a foreign concept to me. Indoor plumbing, two thumbs way, way up. Big fan. But when we think about comfort and convenience, one thing that we often find in this particular stage of life where we live in, a, in an immediate uh, gratification type of world, where I can, within a, a matter of a couple of swipes of my thumb, I can have 10 batches of anything delivered to my door in two to three to six weeks these days uh, for, through Amazon. Everything is within grasp. I can have food delivered to my home. It's particularly since 2020, I really don't have to leave my house for much of anything. That's an instant gratification lifestyle that I can cultivate if I want to. It's very easy to do that. Technology makes access to excess really, really simple. In fact, there are people now, in, in, there's an entire industry whose goal, they're educated in school and then they develop apps, they develop technology to, to take away all of the, the bumps in the road. Uh, Steve Bezos, he's got a, he's got a Blue Origin um, facility in, in Huntsville now, and it's this big, obnoxious building uh, in our research park to match all the other big, obnoxious buildings in the research park. He has made a huge empire off of removing resistance. When I think of something that I like, I can immediately cultivate that desire by getting a little bit of a dopamine hit by looking on my phone, finding that thing, pressing buy now. Or my kid can have my phone without my permission or my knowledge and can hit buy now 17 times. So do I have 17 big swamper tires sitting on my front door for no particular reason? Not a true story, but almost a true story. Because there's no resistance. And I think when we think in terms of the digital age, resistance is one thing that has been taken away very effectively. And for Christians, that allows us, or that should, should cause us to proceed with caution, not with reckless abandonment. The idea of binge watching in scripture is spelled a little differently. It's spelled a lot more like gluttony. But we don't oftentimes calibrate the language. We don't oftentimes see it. That's a Bible word. But we have to see it in today's context. Binge watching is very much a Bible term. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. 
when you think of comfort and convenience, what does this passage say to those two lifestyles? Technology allows us to cultivate a life, or really to cultivate our own gospel of comfort and convenience, which is the exact opposite. It lives in opposition to what Jesus says eternal life looks like. It's very easy, and there are a lot of people, the masses are going to be following this path of least resistance, this path that is paved in comfort, this path that screams convenience, effortless. It's easy, it's not difficult, but the path that leads to eternal life, those that find it are few. It's hard, it's narrow, it looks different, it feels different. The life that we are in pursuit of a gospel-driven life is very, very different than the life that the culture would have us to just go with. As Christians, we have to develop discernment. We have to learn to think spiritually about everything that we put in our life. I am not an anti-technology guy, by no means. I use technology to travel here. We're using technology to help present here. Technology is all around us. We can't hide from it, generally speaking. Now, there's a community that's just a few miles down the road that has proven that, yes, you actually can remove yourself from the vast majority of modern technologies. I'm not looking to live in an Amish community. But I do think that it serves us well to consider that, hey, that life is actually a possibility, even in 2024. We are in control of the life that we cultivate for ourselves. We are in control of the devices and the technologies that we put in our world. We don't have to say yes and embrace everything that comes out. We can discern and we can navigate skillfully and wisely. In Romans chapter 12, Paul writes, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We have to develop and cultivate discernment. Those of you that, that are older in this room have to invest time you have to build and cultivate relationships with emerging generations because the, the platform may change. The technologies may be different, but the spiritual discernment is the same. We have to teach not how to use a device, but how to think about technology and how to think about life. Those are two different things. Get the teenager to help you turn your phone on, and then you help them learn how to use it in a way that glorifies God because it's a tool to steward. It's not a relationship to cultivate. And that's where we've kind of got our signals mixed up. That's where the generations start to be polarizing, thinking that, well, I don't need this newfangled technology. Yeah, you do. Even if you don't need the convenience of it, you need to know why it's central in the life of that teenager that sits on the other end of the pew from you. If we plan to spend eternity together in heaven, we might as well get comfortable now, right? We might as well be in each other's worlds, and each other's lives now, right? Do not love the world or the things in the world. Seems like a very simple statement. Absolutely. Don't love the things in the world. Don't love the world. What is the world? That is a really fundamental, but a really profoundly important question for us to be able to answer. Can we articulate that for emerging generations? Can we articulate that for our own household and our own lives? Is it possible that the things that we thought were good or things that we thought were harmless, Satan has actually been able to leverage them to do us harm and to separate us from our God? Yes. Not only is it possible, it's likely. Technology, is it, is it positive, negative, or neutral? Yes. There's not an algorithm out there that's neutral. So that's, that's a definite hard no. It's powerful. Technology is powerful. Social media is powerful. Phones are powerful. Computers are powerful. Cars are powerful. Dynamite is powerful. And when the creator of dynamite saw that it was used for terror, for destructing, uh, harming humanity, he then created a Nobel Peace Prize named after him because he wanted that to be his legacy, not destruction. Powerful. Technology is powerful, and power is something to discern, something to use and to learn to use wisely. How is modern technology shaping us? This is an important question that I think we need to, to be thinking through uh, in all aspects of life, and every, ever so often. Have you ever heard the phrase, work smarter, not harder? Pretty good phrase, right? I uh, cut grass growing up for about nine or almost 10 years, and so I, I learned to be very efficient 
in that line of work because time is money. And so if you can cut a yard quicker, 10 minutes quicker here, that's 10 more minutes to be moving on to the next one, and so on and so on. But at some point, as we entered into this digital age of automation, this philosophy of work smarter, not harder, turned into a generation that no longer knew how to work hard. Now, I don't mean that every young person is, is lazy. What I mean is that they're growing up in a, a, an age where physical labor is different today. We have uh, 100-something teenagers at, at our church. I don't know of any of them that cut grass today, which, number one, they're, they're just sitting on like thousands of dollars because we got a lot of people with money in our community that don't want to cut the grass. But there's a lot of other things to occupy them. And if the folks that are older in this room grew up in this digital age and that's all they knew, you'd probably be about the same as well. So my encouragement to us is to not start with the judgment, but to start with the relationship. And ask more questions than you answer, especially if you're a younger person. Modern technology shapes us in some very, very profound ways, in ways that we don't even realize it. For instance, the light bulb. What would life be like without the light bulb? Well, have a tornado come through your community, and you, you know what that feels like for a couple of days. In 2011, we had a, a, you know, it was a historic day of tornadoes that came through our community, and we were without power at our house for about six days. By day four or five, I started waking up with the sun and going to bed with the sun. It was kind of remarkable. We had neighborhood block parties almost every night because everybody had to cook the meat that was in the freezer because it was going to spoil because we didn't have power. It was a wake-up call. And in some ways, it was fantastic. Kind of like in 2020, when a lot of things shut down and life as we knew it stopped, changed, pivoted. There were some really, really good, powerful things that happened there. And there are others that were negative. Emerging generations now, the data is showing, they're maturing later in life. What does that mean? Well, they're getting jobs later. They're not working in middle school and high school like they used to. They're driving later. There's a growing percentage of teenagers today that are not getting their license at 16. They're getting their license at 17 and 18 years old. They're drinking later in life. That sounds like a great thing. They're marrying and having children later in life. They're having sex even outside of marriage later in life. Those all sound good. But they're not doing those things later in life because they're more virtuous than previous generations. They're doing that because everything has, has pushed later in life. Gene Twenge has a book called Generations. It's fantastic. I would highly recommend you read it if you have any interest uh, in this idea of generation gaps and how things have changed and how things are very similar. In her research, uh, which I think she has hundreds and hundreds of, of data sets that she's used, it's the largest uh, collaboration of research anyone has done on generations up to date. One of the things that she notes in her research is that the, these items here, that the emerging generations of today are doing all of these things later because a lot of the needs have been met already, but in a digital landscape. Growing up, getting a, a license was, was freedom. Um, I lived in a house that was about 250 feet above a shopping center, just on a big hill, and you, you could fall down almost and land in, the, uh, in the, the parking lot. So I rode my bike to the grocery store I don't know how many times. But when I turned 16 and now I could drive my car one, like, tenth of a mile I didn't even have to, I just, it was a stick shift. I put it in neutral and just coasted it all the way down. But to me, I could have driven to the border of Mexico if I wanted. It was freedom. I got to go beyond the walls of my home. Well, today, from a very early age, our emerging generations are able to game with people that live on the other side of the planet. They're able to explore lands that none, many of us will never see, but they can see it in detail, 4K. The world is indeed smaller and the idea of freedom is a little bit different today than it once was. The idea that, that people are marrying later and having children later, well, that's because we now live in this, uh, this more intellectual economy. And so it, it takes more schooling to get jobs today. Well, if you're in school longer, typically that delays marriage. Delaying marriage delays children. So it's a natural consequence or a natural uh, change that occurs over the period of a couple of generations. They are less equipped emotionally, but more equipped technologically. We've never been more connected to, to the entire world than we, have, than we are today. Mark Zuckerberg has created his own empire based off of this idea that he wants the entire globe to be networked together. Network is his phrase. That's, that's his, his calling, is to connect us all. I don't want to be connected with everyone on the planet. I definitely don't want my children to be connected with everyone on the planet. We're more connected online, but less connected offline. There's more and more research coming out now that's showing us that this idea of being connected from any age on 
is actually more harmful oftentimes than it is helpful. And when is it helpful? Well, that's why we have to, to exercise discernment. That's why we have to think critically and spiritually about the technology that we have in our lives. How are screens impacting us? Here I've got a chart, and for you guys over there, I'm sorry, it's going to be difficult to see, but this one is a graph of Americans 15 and older spending a lot more time alone than they did in 2013. This yellow line they here that goes straight up right around 2012, excuse me, not 2012, uh, 2018, is a yellow line, and that represents how much time people spend alone. These two lines down here are with friends is the green one, and with companions is the red one. There is a marked contrast here, a huge gap. Emerging generations are spending more and more time alone, isolated, less time with, with companions, with, with loved ones, with family, with friends. Here's another chart. Since 2012 in particular is where you see this, this large spike among ages 18 to 25, uh, 25 year olds. There's a 92% increase since 2010 <laughs> And this is of, of uh, anxiety and depression, the prevalence of anxiety and depression. In the counseling world, there, th there's a, a thing called the dark triad, a term, and it refers to anxiety, depression, and suicide ideation. There is a huge exponential increase, but it doesn't hit every single generation. If you see here, ages 26 to 34, this is more the millennials, and then you get into Gen X, and then boomers and older. It's remarkable that during COVID, our older generations were more at risk physically, but fared much better uh, from an emotional standpoint. Younger generations fared better physically, but worse emotionally. Technology is a big conduit for this. It, it hits each generation differently. So there are some big differences. Well, why would that be, be different for older generations? Well, they've had 30, 40, 50, 60 plus years of analog living, right? Of analog uh, connection. Today, teenagers are, are having sexual experiences almost 10 years prior to actually being in a, a marriage relationship. Well, if you go back into the 40s and 50s, there's a, there's a much closer gap. People got married younger. That's part of it. But the other part was the exposure to sexuality and graphic sexual content. It's remarkably different today. I had a friend. He's probably in his early 60s, and we were talking about some of this information. He said, I think... You know, the emerging generations today, I think their biggest challenge is they don't know how to, to like, build. They don't know how to do stuff. They're not as resilient. I said, ah, that's, maybe that's true. He was also helping me with the project, so a little insulting. Um, but, <laughs> but I said, I, I think the biggest challenge and, and the biggest, uh, the most devastating thing right now is, is what's happening sexually with the exposure to sexual content and lustful content. He said, yeah, no, we, you had things like Playboy and magazines. I said, yeah, you it's totally different. And on a neurological level, it's completely different. On the 21st, Sunday the 21st, we're going to spend some more time talking specifically how technology has remapped uh, neurologically the brains of emerging generations and how it's impacted our entire culture. I would encourage you to please be a part of that conversation. We've been a part of a, a pornography pandemic a whole lot longer than we've been a part of a COVID pandemic. And I dare say a lot more destruction has happened on the spiritual level. <clears throat> so three questions that, that every adolescent tries to, to find out, tries to find an answer to is, who am I? That's all about identity. Where do I belong? That's all about community. And why do I matter? That's all about purpose. These are three questions that I dare say many of us adults are still trying to answer today. These are very deeply rooted, God-centered questions. The difference in today and in previous generations is that today, emerging generations are going online to find the answer to these very, very deep identity, God identity centered questions, which means that they're getting answers from everywhere. Today, you can go to ChatGPT, and, and the danger of ChatGPT is it's very conversational. Uh, when I was growing up in, in elementary school, we had uh, gigapets. I don't know if you remember those little uh, Tamagotchis. They were basically a keychain, and it had this little digital, it was a pet. It was a little dog or a cat, and you had to press a button a certain amount of days to feed it. You had to make sure that it laid down and got sleep, and if somebody stole it and just started pressing buttons, it would probably die. Well, what happened is that you started to kind of develop a little bit of a relationship with this little digital device. I want to keep them alive. 
don't, don't steal my keychain. It was ridiculous. I admit it now. I get it. I understand. But as a child, this was something that I had a responsibility for. I had developed a bit of a relationship there. Today, as emerging generations grow up, I know as an adult that this is a chat bot that's just processed. It's a highly, highly powerful, really, really impressive word processing uh, piece of software. It's, it's really remarkable. I use ChatGPT all the time for different tasks and different things. But if I'm an 8, 9, 10, 15, 16, 17 year old, and 2 a.m. in the morning, I'm sitting there and I'm texting with ChatGPT, asking it all of these deep, dark questions of life. That's not good. Because it's not necessarily concerned with my soul. Its concern is processing its algorithm to learn the questions that I ask, to process all these data sets from the, the entire internet, which means everybody has, has equal, equal say, putting it all together and, and spitting it back to me in a very conversational format. The conversational side of this is the scary part. Because emerging generations are developing relationships with their technology. Technology is a tool for us to steward, not a relationship to cultivate. Technology allows us to stay connected in our communication, but it's, it's the relationship that is the substance and the content. The fact that I can call my mom living in another state is great, but the phone is, is not the relationship. My mother, the connection, the relationship, the, the life experience we have together, that is the substance. And that's what younger generations, they're missing out on that part of it. We have to show them. We have to be a part of their lives as adults in the room. We have to invest in them. And we have to show them that they are worth being invested in and they are worth investing in other people. If they leave this place after growing up here and they haven't experienced forgiveness, they haven't experienced accountability, they haven't experienced encouragement, they haven't seen what a, con a, converted, a truly converted life looks like, then we have failed. And not only have we failed in our own living out of the gospel, which means our soul is probably in jeopardy, but we've also not equipped them to go out into this new world. <clears throat> this is a really, really important topic for us to spend time talking about. So what has changed? Where are emerging generations going to find their interest? They're going online. They're going to these places. The Internet became very prevalent in, in my childhood when I was in, in high school in particular. Everyone now had a computer. And then when I got to college, those computers got smaller. Then everyone got phones, and those phones started doing more and more. First they were telephones, then they were telephones and text machines, and then they were computers, and that's where we are today. There's actually been a, a big uh, push back to get flip phones. They've made a, a new uh, surge into popularity. There's a gentleman by the name of Wendell Berry. Uh, if you're in farming, you may have heard of him. He is a, he's written a lot of essays, written several books. He is a farmer. And he wrote a book called The Unsettling of America. And in that book, he talked about how our country has, has really sort of legislated our way from an agriculture to an agribusiness. As a country, now, we, we have laws in place that make it really difficult oftentimes for the small family farm to exist anymore. Farming, because of, particularly because of different regulations, has to be massive scale thousands of acres, and you have to lease massive pieces of equipment, and you have to continue to be in, in this cycle of debt in order to actually make any kind of profit, and it doesn't really work great because there's, the food is not as nutrient anymore. The, farmer, it, the, the farm itself is not as, as joyful as it once was. Farmers are stressed. They're in debt, and he says the cure maintains the disease. Because we've created this situation where this is the way it has to be. And in our minds, we've created a situation where we have to be connected technologically in all of these ways. A perfect example is, is on social media, the cure maintains the disease. I have to have a filter to, to change blemishes. Or I have to edit every photo before I actually put it out there. Because I want to show the real me, but I also want to edit it. There's been a, a big surge in Be Real, which is an app that's really popular right now. Because it is, generally speaking, you get, capture you in the moment takes a picture with both front and back side of your camera, so you get the moment. It's not just if you're standing in front of a mirror trying to pose. Well, you're kind of called out because you see the mirror on the other side. There is a push towards authenticity, and that's what has always made the church unique and different. When we confess sin at this place, then we promote reconciliation. In Matthew chapter 5, which we just read from there, not only did Jesus say, tell us how to, what to look for as far as the road, he also said that before you go into the temple and offer your sacrifice, I want you to go and find the person that you know has an issue with you. 
someone that has a beef with you, you leave your sacrifice here before you ever enter the temple. You go and be reconciled, then come back. Growing up in the Church of Christ, we always put at the center of our identity worship. And here Jesus is saying, before you worship, be reconciled. That's a big deal. This is a place where we reconcile. If we don't reconcile well, how in the world will the world know how to reconcile? If there's one thing I could change about every person on the planet, it's that we would reconcile really, really well. How many marriages, how many homes would be saved, would be healed? And how many people would come to know Christ if we all reconciled really, really well? But instead, the cure preserves the disease. And so we think we need to have more of this when this is anything other than Jesus. We're wrong. We're just maintaining the disease. We have to be intentional with our attention because what has our attention has our hearts. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If you're looking for a verse that really connects with today, I don't know if there's a better verse in all of Scripture than Psalm 119 verse 37. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. How much time do we spend looking at worthless things? Things that don't bring spiritual life. Things that don't bring the life of Christ. That don't cultivate Christ. Don't cultivate gospel thinking. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. We are distracted by design. There's a, a fellow by the name of Tristan Harris. He's a former Google ethicist. If you've heard of or seen the, the documentary, The Social Dilemma, he's one of the main guys behind it. He has coined this term, uh, the, the, um, excuse me, the attention economy, which means that kind of like that bell gets our attention, your phone has little bells that go off ever so often and say, hey, wake up, or hey, go do this, or hey, don't forget, this is on your schedule today, or hey, you've got a message. Do you know why your messages are a little red, round dots? Because color science is a real thing. Because we respond to red differently. It's a reason why those exit signs are red. It's a reason why when you go to an intersection, it's a red stop sign and not a blue stop sign. If there's a blue stop sign, we got a lot more wrecks. When I was driving up here tonight even, uh, I glanced over at one of the, the exit signs. And there was a sign for Arby's and there was a sign for a love stop. Love's is, is mostly yellow. Arby's is red, and it's had a white logo. What did I look at first? I looked at Arby's. Red has a sense of urgency. And software designers, they know this. I have a friend that works in, uh, he's in cartography, so he makes maps, and uh, he's a software guy. So he, he writes the code for a lot of mapping software for uh, like utility companies and things like that. Well, he was on a team recently, and it was a four-person team. He was the lone software engineer. The other three people on his team were all uh, psychology people. They all had degrees in psychology. And these are the good guys. They're making maps for first responders. What about people who are for profit or people that are for power, people that are for influence, that can that hire massive armies of thought engineers? We are in, indeed in the midst of an attention economy, and we need to be wise about it. Derek Sherman wrote that research into brain plasticity has revealed that our brain changes into response to what we do. It's a notion summarized by, summarized by Hebb's rule that cells that fire together wire together. One thing that stuck out to me most about this, um, this excerpt is his sentence here that says, The digital revolution has plunged us into a continuous state of partial attention. And in this state, people no longer have time to reflect, contemplate, or make thoughtful decisions. If there was ever a mindset that was opposed to the teachings of God, it's a mindset that can't rest, that can't be still, that can't think deeply, deeply and that can't make thoughtful decisions. Perhaps St. Augustine was right thousands of years ago when he suggested habit, if not resisted, soon becomes necessity. There's this sense of urgency that we read about in Scripture. And it has nothing to do with the political, political climate of the day. It has nothing to do with the stuff that we own and collect. It has everything to do with the coming of Christ and the coming of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Sometimes our technology cultivates a different anticipation in our hearts, and we have to be aware of that, and we have to be mindful of that, and we have to guard against that. What technology promises is not always what technology delivers. Mark Zuckerberg is case in point. His whole philosophy that we all need to be connected, that we will be healthier because we'll be connected with everyone, is actually blatantly different than what the research shows. Where we are today with regards to social media is where we were roughly in the, the late 80s and early 90s with big tobacco. 
In the 90s in particular, I remember a lot of commercials, there's a big push uh, to, to really show the negative of nicotine addiction. Did you know that the very first article from the, the American U.S. Surgeon General that said that nicotine and cigarettes and tobacco products were harmful came out, I think it was in 1964, 1965? But it wasn't until almost 30-something years later that we finally got public opinion that said, hey, this is killing us. And so now you have labels slapped all over cartons and boxes, and, and big tobacco industry has swung in its influence in the other direction. Well, it's kind of the same. The research we have now is research of what has happened over the last 10 to 20 years. If we wait for legislation to tell us what's right and what's wrong as parents, then it's like waiting for the guardrail to go up on the big cliff. They don't put a guardrail up until people go off the side a certain number of times, right? You drive over that little black strip at an intersection well before they actually put in the stoplight. We've lost a generation and a half already. There's no more excuse. We are now equipped with the knowledge of what's actually going on, what's actually being done around us, and we have to not only think spiritually, we have to articulate that for emerging generations. They are equipped to use this technology in some remarkable ways, but they have to know how to think about it as well. And that's where we come in as the adults in the room. Devices and platforms facilitate communication. Relationships cultivate community. What kind of relationships are we cultivating in here? How do you use your devices to cultivate that relationship? Sometimes somebody will tell you more online than they'll tell you in person. Don't use Facebook just as a birthday reminder. Use it for ministry. If you have a device or you have a platform, how are you connecting with people? How are you stewarding that and leveraging it for the gospel? In 20, this past uh, May, the U.S. Surgeon General today came out with a, a study, and his advice here was social media use is comp uh, compromising the sleep, talking about children and, and adolescents, and invaluable in-person time with family and friends. We're in the middle of a national youth mental health crisis. I'm concerned that social media is an important driver of that crisis. This is the U.S. Surgeon General. This is not a minister of the gospel. This is the world saying this is harmful to our children. U.S. Senator Richard Blumenthal, Congress failed to meet the moment on social media. When was the last time you heard a congressman say, hey, we got it wrong? It doesn't happen. Granted, this was, this was a quote that happened on like C-SPAN 4 or 5, but still it happened. He said it out loud and it's recorded. When the politicians are saying, hey, we got it wrong, something's absolutely broken. We're not who we think we are. We, we'll, we'll skip that because we're, we're about to be done here. Um, I wanted to end with Deuteronomy chapter 6. Likely a verse that you've heard often. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. You live out the words of God and then you tell the emerging generations about the words and the ways of God. I'm afraid that too often we live out this passage something kind of like this. Hear, O oh, modern day Christian, the Lord your God, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love your devices with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently, diligently to your children. You shall look at them when you sit in your house at the table, dinner table, when you walk by the way, when you lie down before you go to bed, when you wake up to get out of bed. They shall be bound to your hand, and they shall almost literally be as frontless between your eyes. Our devices go with us everywhere. And if we think that they're not forming and shaping us, we're either blatantly ignorant or dangerously immature. Those are not, those are not options anymore. There's no excuse. There's no passive parenting. There's no passive grandparenting. There's no passive mentoring in the church. We all have a hand in this, regardless of the age and regardless of how, how you use technology. We have to learn to discern the technology and the tools that God has given us to steward in this age to leverage for the gospel. Let's bow. Father in heaven, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather in your name tonight to challenge each other to think more deeply about the devices and the technologies that we implement in our homes and in our everyday life. Father, we acknowledge that these things are molding us and shaping us and transforming us, and we pray that you would give us the wisdom, cultivate discernment in us of how to navigate this age in a way that glorifies you and grows your kingdom. Help us to guard against unhealthy habits 
Help us to guard our marriages, to guard our families, to guard our relationships. Help us to use technology to leverage, to proclaim your gospel, to make it louder than it's ever been, and to truly go into all the world in ways that we've never been able to do before. But Father, help us to do that with wisdom and discernment so that we don't find ourselves being controlled and molded and shaped into something other than the image of Jesus. We love you and we thank you for allowing us to wear his name. It's through him that we pray. Amen.